to understand why we had that period we normally start transmission by seven o'clock and the choir did so well that they finished in good time and we still had that time so that's why we took the time to pray i'm sure you understand say yes i understand <laughs> father we thank you for this time we thank you for your people for their faithfulness we well, bless your name for what you're doing. We're asking, Lord, that today, that this word learning will do good in every life in Jesus' name. That the word will penetrate every heart. It will not be like the word on the wayside. It will not be like the word on stony ground. It will not be like the word on the thorny ground. It will fall on good hearts honest heart, cultivated heart, a ready heart that will take the word of God and bear fruit in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our lights will shine. Our life will impact the lives of other people. And we live to glorify your name. And our lives will draw other people into the kingdom of God. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said another good amen. amen. God bless you. Consider tonight, we're looking at Mark chapter 4. And we're learning and studying from verse 21 all through to verse 34. Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 21. In verse 21, and he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to set on a candlestick? The Lord is using natural things, normal things, everything of, the, of every day that we know, that we understand to bring out spiritual lessons so that from what we know, we then go to what is not known. That's why he made use of these parables. He's giving us some parables here now. It's an illustration of a light, a candle, a lamp that is lighted. And then it must be put on the candlestick. It must be put in a place where that lamp and that light will show light to everyone around. We don't light a candle or light a lamp and put it under a bed under a bushel, under a basket, under a bowl. We put it in a place where the light will go through and shine to everyone. Look at verse 33. 
and with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to bear it. A great teacher, a master teacher, a teacher from heaven. He made use of the things they knew and the things they have learned so that he will show them the things of heaven. As a master teacher, he taught concerning individuals. So as we come today, there is a lesson for every individual. In everything, we're going to teach and expose and expound from the word of God. Not only to individuals, he also taught nations. He taught nations. Not only nations, he taught the whole world as well as Christendom. I want you to look at verse 21 now. From verse 21, I'm reading to verse 25. It says, And he said unto them, Is the candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to set on a candlestick? It's talking to individuals. You light candles in your home. You light lamps in your home. And how do you do that? Why do you do that? So that can shine light to everyone so you will not stumble. It says the word of God to you is a light. And it comes to you. And you bear that light. And as an individual, you bear the light so that you'll see the path that you are walking. Verse 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret. But it shall come abroad. It's talking about our lives. That we shouldn't think there's something secret. I can do that and heaven will not know. I can do that. It will never come up. I can do that. It will never be revealed. He said there's nothing at all under the sun, anywhere, in a home, in an office, in a market, in a community, anywhere. Whatever is done will come to the open. Verse 23, if any man, talking to the individual, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And then he goes on to verse 24. And he said unto them, take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. It's telling us that what we don't use, we lose. If you have knowledge, light, gift, skill, you don't use it, you lose it. But if you practice, if you use what you have, the more you use, the more you develop. And the more you use, the more you acquire. The more you use, the more you know how to use. Verse 25, For he that has to him shall be given, and he shall have, and, the, the, and he that has not from him shall be taken even that which he has. Verse 26, And he said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man shall cast seed into the ground, and shall sleep and rise night and day, and the seed shall spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. Again, he's telling us another parable now. He says, a farmer goes to the field, goes to his farm, and he puts the seed on the ground, and then he comes back home. He has to sleep, and then he wakes up, and he sleeps in the night, day after day, and week after week, and the plant or the seed continues to grow, and the farmer knows not how. He's talking about the seed of the word of God that we receive in our hearts. And then he brings salvation. It brings sanctification. It brings the power of God. It brings assurance. Teaches us about heaven. And begin to acquire conviction. Conviction according to the word. And we know not how. Because it is the work of God. And then he tells us in verse 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Of herself. Of herself. The seed you have in your heart will grow in your cell, not in another. The one you accept, the one you believe, 
and the one you receive will grow in yourself not in another first the bleach the beginning then the ear more comes out after that the full corn in the ear that's why when we hear first of all there's conviction and then we hear again there's conversion and we hear again there's consecration we hear again there's commitment and we're growing the ear the blade the ear and the full corn we're producing fruit and it is growing every time because we're committing ourselves to what we're hearing every time verse 29 but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he put it forth put it in the sickle because the harvest is come the harvest is talking about here is actually the final day the day of reckoning and the day when we will tell the Lord what we have done with every opportunity we have got and with every privilege we have had in the house of God and in life in particular. We'll talk about that later. And he said, here's another parable now. He's going to tell another parable. He's teaching them and teaching the people and teaching us about the kingdom of God as to things that pertain to the kingdom of God by all these parables and illustrations for starting. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? I was talking about the kingdom of God, not about the kingdom of the world, about the kingdom of God. Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all seeds that be in the earth. Talking about the kingdom, about Christendom, about the religion that Christ has brought. He said, it started with a small seed and it is sown in a spot on the earth in Jerusalem. And then now it's going to tell us about the growth, about the expansion all over the earth. It says in verse 32, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs. You understand what he's saying? It becomes greater than any other religion, it becomes greater than any other profession, any other confession and shooters out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And after you had given that, we are now told, and with many such parables speak, he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. Those who were young, he knew they were there. He spoke in such a way they would understand. And those who are matured, educated parents, he spoke in a way they will understand. He spoke to the level of everyone so that everyone will know that's for me. Every family will know that's for me. Every community will know that's for me. And the nation will know that's for me. And those who read it in any part of the world, they will know that's for me as they were able to bear it. Verse 34. And without a parable, speaking not unto them. And when they were alone, and when they were alone, what were they doing? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, with well, the disciples, had given us a good example. We come together in a public meeting like this, and we hear the word of God. And then when we are alone, what do we do? We still talk about the word, husband and wife in the house, parents and children in the house, brothers and the siblings in the house. As we hear the word of God, we turn it over in our hearts. We think about it again in our hearts. We meditate again in our hearts. It says, when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. I pray. We'll be ready, disciples, ready to learn every time in Jesus' name. We're looking at the study tonight on the topic, the significant growth 
of God's kingdom on earth. The significant growth of God's kingdom on earth. The Lord Jesus taught the people that were present before him. Not only that, he taught principles that were true at that time and that are true at this time, principles that are true at all times. And he taught prophetically. He taught them to even expect the things that will happen at the end of time and after time had passed away. What a teacher, a teacher that was relevant, relevant to the people. He wasn't teaching something that was redundant, unnecessary, not essential, something you couldn't relate with. He taught them what was relevant. Not only that, number two, he taught what was revealing, revealing. He showed the common things. He showed the illustrations. He gave the parables and he revealed deep truths, great truths. He taught something relevant, something revealing, something redeeming. He taught them so they'd be redeemed. He taught them so they'll be forgiven. He taught them so they will be saved. And when you come to hear the word of God, you must have that attitude. Hey, that is relevant to my life. That is revealing in my life. That is redeeming in my soul. The word of God has come to you so that it will redeem you and redeem you from sin. He taught them something regenerating, regenerating, something that came to turn them around, that came to change them, that came to transform their lives. When Christ teaches us, or when we look at the teaching of Christ and we explain and we expand and we apply, it's supposed to make us discover I've been in the dark, I must now come to the light. His teaching is regenerating. His teaching was refreshing, refreshing. They say, yes, I see. Now I can see. I didn't know that before. This is refreshing. They are the peace in their heart. They have the purity in their hearts. And they had the cleansing of the word like water. It became refreshing unto them. His teaching was renewing. It renewed their lives. It renewed their commitments. It renewed their vision for heaven. It renewed their pursuit and purpose in life. It was renewing. His teaching was recovering. The people who had gone away from the truth, the people who have gone very far from the past that leads to life eternal. His teaching was recovering. It restored them. Well then, as you come to hear the word of God, and especially today as we're looking at these verses, I pray it will be relevant in your life. Revealing in your life. Redeeming in your soul. Regenerating in your spirit. Refreshing to your heart. Renewing in your commitment. And recovering you to the path that leads to glory in Jesus' name. Good amen from the church. The significant growth of God's kingdom on earth. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the shining godliness of saints from the heart. Something happens in our hearts. And then the light is there. And that light is shining forth in godliness. The shining godliness of saints from the heart. I come to point number two. In point number two, the silent growth of the seed till harvest is the seed we put in the ground. And the farmer goes back home, sleeping in the night, waking up in the day, and involved with other activities. And while he has put the seed in the, in the earth, then there is silent growth 
and the farmer knows not how the silent growth of the seed till harvest. Point number three, the significant great number of seekers in his house. The significant great number of seekers. Now the seed, mustard seed, grows up and has a lot of branches. And then it says, many people come to seek protection under the shelter of his habitation. Under the shelter of his house. Point number three, the significant great number of seekers in his house. Point number one, the shining godliness of saints from the heart. I'm coming back to Mark chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 21 to verse 25. It says in verse 21, and he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to set not to set it on a candlestick for there is nothing heat which shall not be manifested neither was anything kept secret but that it shall come abroad if any man have ears to hear let him hear i have ears to hear tonight i am hearing tonight i will hear and the word will do good in your life in jesus name verse 24 and he said unto them take each what ye hear with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you and unto you that hear shall more be given for he that has to him shall be given and he that has not from him shall be taken even that he has that's what we're looking at as we look at the shining godliness of saints from the heart Matthew chapter 5 I read from verse 14 Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid it's telling us the same thing there's another parable now it says a city is on a hilltop it cannot be hidden everybody passing along will see and then it goes on neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Your light will shine. Godliness will shine through you. The grace of God will shine through you. The goodness of God will shine through you. But he says, you must put an effort. And you must make sure that what you are learning is coming out in practical godliness that other people will see. Look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. Don't hide it. You have salvation. Let your light so shine before men. Let the result and the outcome of that salvation shine before men. You are converted, let the light of that conversion shine before me. You have repented, let the light of that repentance shine before me. You have taken a decision, I'm going to follow the Lord. Anywhere I go, anywhere I am, I will do what Christ will want me to do. Now when you get to the public, let it be so. Let your light so shine before me that they may see your good works. They may see the outcome of your salvation. They may see the outcome of your conversion. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your light will shine. Ephesians chapter 5. I read from verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, past tense. You are no more like that. 
your life is different now. Things are different now. Christ came, Christ, the light of the world, has come to your heart. And the things you used to do, you do them no more. I didn't hear your amen. The places you used to go, you go there no more. And the things you used to drink, you drink them no more. You see how the amen is going down? And the worldly dresses you used to wear, you wear them no more. The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. Verse 14, wherefore, he says, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Christ will give you more light. But coming back to Mark chapter 4, and we're looking at it from verse 22. Mark chapter 4, from verse 22. Look at this, verses 22 and 23. Nothing hidden nothing hidden verse 24 needful hearing necessary hearing noble hearing verse 25 new heights new heights you're gaining new heights every day and you're walking in the path that leads you higher and higher and higher number one nothing hidden. We're looking at verse 22. Verse 22, for there is nothing hid. It's right there. We shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but it shall come abroad. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. What the Lord is telling us here is that with the eyes of God watching the whole earth, there's nothing hidden. With the record of every action that is being reaching down up there, there is nothing hidden. There is no whisper into the ears of anybody. Let's practice this and let's do this evil. Nobody will know. As you are whispering it, heaven knows already. And on the final day, everything is going to come to the open. It's telling us to so live your life as if all your private acts will one day come to the open. Live your lives as if all your dealings, all your transactions in business will eventually come to the open. Nothing hidden. It says live your life as if all your relationships, man and woman, that everything will eventually come to the open. Live your life as if every counseling you give will eventually be brought to the open. Live your life in such a way that every agreement you make with anybody will eventually come to the open. Live your life in such a way that every discussion will eventually come to the open. Don't think it is hidden. I can get away with this. I can do anything. Jesus said, nothing is hidden. Look at Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, I read from verse 26. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Fear them not, therefore. Fear them not, therefore. If somebody wants to compel you to do evil, and then in the past, you'll be afraid. But you understand? The thought in your heart 
that makes you more afraid of man than God, it will come to the open. And what shame it will be. You call yourself a Christian and say that Christ lives in you and you fear man more than God. It will come to the open. Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak in the light. Can you say that? Can you tell anybody what I do with you? You can tell it anywhere. What I say to you, you can tell it anywhere. What I agree with you, you can tell it anywhere. And if you live like that, you live a righteous life. Because, you know, everything you do, there is nothing hidden. And Jesus said, what I tell you in darkness, that speak in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the house tops, nothing hidden. Somebody say that with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. With every secret thing. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Come back to Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 24 now. Mark chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 24 it says in verse 24 and he said unto them take heed what ye hear take heed what ye hear with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you and unto you that hear shall more be given this talking about needful hearing necessary hearing noble hearing it says when you hear take heed what you hear what does that mean hear and meditate hear and examine yourself with what you hear i've heard that i need to turn that over in my mind how does that apply to me hear and examine yourself hear and repent i hear that god must have something in mind to tell me this and to reveal this to me i check up with my life in what i'm hearing i hear and i repent hear and heed hear and obey hear and take heed and say if i had heard this before i would not have gone into that error into that mistake but thank god he has forgiven me the past as i hear now i am going to take heed here and heed here and pray god tells us something from heaven and human energy and human strength cannot fully obey to please the Lord. And so after hearing, we go to pray and we say, Lord, this is beyond me. I cannot manage this by myself. I am praying that you'll give me grace to do what I'm hearing. Hear and internalize. Don't allow you to fall on stony ground. Don't allow you to fall on the wayside ground. Hear and internalize what you hear. Hear and be transformed. Hear and be transformed. Come back to that verse 24. I'm reading the first line. Take heed what you hear. The content of what you hear. The subject of what you hear. The understanding of what you hear, the conception of what you hear, take heed what you hear. Come to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 18. In Luke chapter 8, verse 18, look at this now. 
Take it therefore how ye hear. In Mark, it's what you hear. In, in Luke, it is how you hear. You know, when somebody is talking to you, you can sit down in a posture that says, I don't want to talk now. I don't want to listen to you now. I don't want anything coming to my mind now. Leave me alone. Your facial expression, your mood, your attitude, even your eyeballs can indicate. I don't want to hear now. Take it how you hear. Pay attention. Let this speak to you. Let this penetrate your heart. Take it how you hear. Because it is how you hear that will tell how it will work inside your heart. Look at that verse 18. Take it therefore how ye hear. For whosoever has to him shall be given. And whosoever has not from him shall be taken even that which is seemed to have. The understanding of that is this. You go to a class. Already you've gone through the primary school. And you retain everything you learned in the primary school. Now you come to this new class and you want to learn. You are happy you are in this new class. And you remember all that you have learned before. They are not going to repeat all those things anymore. They are going to build on what you had learned before. And so to him that has some knowledge, more knowledge will be added. But for the pupil, the child that comes and is not really interested, that the mommy are pushing him to go to school. And he doesn't even remember what he learned in the primary school. And the teacher is teaching. He's not getting anything at all. Even what he seemed to have got before, everything is taken away. Come back to the Christian life. We're born again. At the time of being born again, the word of God penetrated our hearts. We had conviction. Our conscience was awakened. And we realized I must confess that to God. I must confess that to man. I must make right my life. And then we we'll keep on hearing the word of God after we were saved. And then we hear about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Because we're interested. Because we want to hear every word. And we're taking heed what we have heard. The salvation is intact. The conviction is intact. And now new knowledge comes. We take that to the Lord in prayer. We're sanctified. And then we're still reading the Bible. And we keep salvation intact. Sanctification intact. And now we're growing. Because we're taking heed what we hear. There's another kind of hearer. He said in the past he was converted. In the past he had conviction. In the past he had a tender conscience. But now over time he has become careless. He does not take heed what he hears. He comes to Bible study. He comes to Sunday worship. As we hear the word there, that's where he has forgotten. Even the convictions of the early years will be erased. He will forget. It's like, you understand, somebody, a sister. You used to know her name before she got married, her surname. And now she's got married, and she has a new surname, and you have not pronounced the other name, the maiden name, for a long time. And one day, something comes up. You want to remember that maiden name? You won't remember is forgotten because you are not even familiar with her anymore now the same thing with the word of god make sure that you are building on the word and building on the word let not the word be lost on you this word will not be lost in your life in jesus name 
I'm looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. How you hear, how you hear. You are not saying that's his opinion, that's his idea, that's his interpretation. That's what he thinks. I think differently. You're not taking it as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's when you take it as the word of God and you take heed how you hear, what you hear, it will be a fruit in your life. Okay, it will be a fruit in my life. We come back to Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 25. Mark chapter 5, chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 25. It tells us here in Mark chapter 4, verse 25. For he that has, to him shall be given. He that has, to him shall be given. And he that has not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. This one is talking about new heights. New heights. New heights I'm gaining every day. Have you noticed in the office, somebody is busy, and he has a lot of assignments, and the director or the manager wants to give extra assignment. And guess who they are going to give that assignment to? The one that's already occupied. He knows how to work. He loves working. He's committed to working. He never says no to any new assignment. He that has, to him shall be given. Have you noticed uh, when we went to school, as we're learning and learning, the more you are ready to reach, the more you get the new thing the teacher is saying. Have you noticed in the church, the one who is born again, on fire for God, and always eager, I want to go and learn. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of God, raining or sunshine is going there. Everything that he hears, he understands. While the other person is an old timer, will say, "What reference did they, did they call? What passage are, you, are they reading?" The young man who is all ears, he has heard. He's opening the Bible, and then as we finish, he can recall from beginning to the end what we have learned. While the other person, a careless hearer, a careless learner, and you can ask about one hour after that, is forgotten. He's telling us, when you have more, will be given unto you. When you have strength and you exercise every time, more strength you will gain. I pray you have new heights in Jesus' name. We grow and we reach higher heights and we have, we reach new experiences in Christ when we have and we're reaching forth for more. We're saved, we want more. We're sanctified, we want more. We're separated from the world, we want more. We're spirit filled, we want more. We're saturated with scripture. We we'll want more. We're we'll supplicating and praying. We we'll want more. The one that gets more and more and more in his life is the one that is not stationary. You will grow. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 13. 
reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, For whosoever has, to him shall be given, he'll have more. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not, no interest, no passion, no zeal, no diligence, no dedication, he has not from him shall be taken even what, even that he has. If you have seen anybody whose right hand is all right, strong, active, agile, he puts a bandage around his neck and he hangs that hand there. The hand is all right. There's nothing wrong with the hand. But he hangs the hand in the bandage and he refuses to bring the hand out. After one month, he brings out the hand, stretch it, he cannot. He has no interest to use the hand, and the usefulness of the hand is gone. Have you learned at French at school, in a secondary school, even university level, even at the university level, you learned French. But after some six months, one year, more than that, you don't use the language. You forget everything you ever knew. That's what he's saying. To him that has and is using what he has, he'll have more. And the one that hangs it up and he will not use what he has, he will lose what he has. I will not lose what I have. Say it if you are not going to lose. Point number two now. The silent growth of the seed till harvest. The silent growth of the seed till harvest time. We're coming to Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 26. Mark chapter 4. I read from verse 26, and he said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed shall spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. He knoweth not how. The seed springs up, the seed grows up, and yet the farmer who puts the seed there in the ground knoweth not how. Verse 28, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. It's not the farmer that makes it to grow. It says it bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle, and because the harvest is come. Three things. Number one, discerning not how. Not knowing how. The work we do is the work of God. The planting of the seed is the work of God. The sowing of the word of salvation in any heart is the work of God. And we shouldn't bother ourselves to understand how will it grow, how will it germinate, trying to fully understand before we sow. It's futile, it's useless. Good labor on, you cannot know how the seed grows. Come to chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. 
I read from verse 17, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 17. Discerning not how. Verse 17, it tells us Ecclesiastes 8, 17. Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the heaven. Salvation is the work of God. You cannot discern how. Sanctification is the work of God. Teach it and preach it and leave the rest to God. You cannot discern how. And a change of life, transformation by the word, by the word of God is the work of God. You cannot discern how. He says, I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, Father, though a wise man seek to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Don't say, I don't know whether the word is working or not. I don't know whether it is bearing fruit or not. I don't know whether it is helping anybody or not. I'm going to make a research. And when I know it is working, then I will get up and do more work. He says, you'll never know. You'll never know. That's in the hands of God. Go and labor on. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. You preach in the boss, is it of any use? Don't bother yourself, keep on preaching. And you uh, preach uh, with morning cry, megaphone. Is anybody hearing? Don't worry yourself about that. Keep on preaching. You are in the children's church and you are walking there. Is any of the children hearing? Don't worry. Keep on teaching. And you are the youth ministry, campus ministry, or adult ministry. Keep on walking. It will bear fruit. You will not labor in vain. Your work will be a fruit in Jesus' name. We're coming to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. John chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 7. In John chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell. Canst not tell. You cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Your work will be blessed of God. We're coming back to Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 28. Mark chapter 4, verse 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Development by herself. Development by herself you will develop god will make you grow the amen is too small because it says it's bringing forth fruit is developing by herself god will make us grow don't keep on examining you know sometimes uh, you have, uh, if somebody has sickness, for example, and he's gone to the doctors, and the doctors have uh, given him some pills, take this in the morning, and take this in the evening, 
and take this for two weeks. He gets the pills. He uses the first one in the morning. And then he's checking up himself. Am I okay? Am I all right? You will not see with just one pill. And then you see the one in the evening and he's checking up. Do I feel better? Is this of any use? Maybe I should throw them away. Don't throw them away. It is working. I said it is working. The same thing, the word is working in your life. And you have heard it, you have heard it, you have heard it. Am I different? God knows. Have I changed? God knows. Am I cleaner? God knows it will work. We're coming to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I read from verse 6. From verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Looks like this is for me, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Christ. Give a good amen. amen. When Jesus comes and the saints are taken up, you'll be among them. I will see you when we get to heaven. But pastor, I am slow. Don't talk about that. I don't always remember everything. Don't talk about that. I will see you in heaven. Somebody was wondering how water is doing anything. He takes his bath every day. And he says, is there any change? The word, the water is refreshing your life. Don't give up. I said, don't give up. I said, don't give up. Today, you are not like you were yesterday. And this year, you are not like you were last year. Something is taking place. And it will go on until Christ comes for you to take you to heaven in Jesus' name. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. For it is God which walketh in you. Where is God walking? It is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let's come back to Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 29. Destiny at harvest destiny at the time of harvest we're looking at uh, mark chapter 4 verse 29 but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he put us in the sickle because it is harvest time harvest is come that harvest is the final destiny of each man that's the harvest and the time when the final destiny will be determined. If the final harvest is the final judgment, when it says the harvest is come. What we have done with the word we have heard will determine what God will do with us. Let me say that again. What you have done with the word you have heard will determine what God will do with you on that harvesting day. You have heard the word of salvation, what you have done with that word of salvation. Whether you got it, you received it, you believed it, you embraced it, and you kept it, will determine what God will do with you on a final day. 
you have had the word of holiness what you've done with that word of holiness whether you received it you accepted it you embraced it and you experienced it and you're living in the experience of holiness what you have done with that word will determine what what god will do with you on that day of harvest harvest let me show you what that means harvest in that passage means the judgment in joel chapter 2 in joel chapter 2 i'm reading from chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 12 joel chapter 3 verse 12 let the heathen be wicked and come up to the valley of jehoshaphat for there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. It's the day of judgment. Put in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. It's the harvest of judgment. Come, get you down. For the press is full and the fats overflow. For, there, for their wickedness is great. Harvest, in that sense, Harvest in that passage is judgment day. Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. These are the words of Jesus. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend people who are offensive, people who are stinking in the nostrils of God, all the offend and them which do iniquity. This is the day of the harvest and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, then shall the righteous, those who are saved, are you there? Those who are holy, are you there? Those who believe the Lord will prepare them for that day. I said, are you there? God will make you ready. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's the harvest and the children of God, those who are saved, those who are righteous, those who live holy on earth, eventually they'll get to heaven. But the people who are negligent, who neglect the grace of God and the word of God and will not get themselves ready. When the saints get to heaven, the sinners will go to hell. And you know, to think about that, what will your destiny be? In Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 13. Revelation 14, verse 13. And I heard the voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. You will not die outside the Lord. You will not die outside the grace of God. If you die before the rapture takes place, you will die in the Lord. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. It will give you reward in heaven. Verse 14, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one such like the Son of Man, having on his having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, 
crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrusting a sickle on the earth, and the earth was rich. And another angel came out of the temple, which is heaven, which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. Then it says in verse 18, And another angel came out of the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her graves are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into, tell me, tell me, tell me, the great wine press of the wrath of God. That's judgment. But in verse 13, let me read verse 13 again. I believe this will be your Lord. And I heard the voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. As you get to heaven, because I believe the word of God will work effectually in your heart, in your life, in Jesus' name. Unbelievers, sinners who die in their sin, they will go to hell. I will not go to hell. You will not go to hell in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three, the significant great number of seekers in his house, in his habitation. We're coming to Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 30. Mark chapter 4. Reading from verse 30, and he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? With, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that are in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. What does that mean? It's talking about the kingdom of God. It had a very small beginning. And now the master teacher is prophesying that the kingdom seekers will grow in number and they will grow in grace and they will grow in their skill in touching the lives of many people until a very great number throughout the whole world will be in that kingdom. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. If you come to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 31. Matthew 13, verse 31. Another parable put ye forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. It's the least. Think about how it started. Twelve disciples. 12 apostles, 70 others, and then 3,000, day of Pentecost, and then 5,000, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and then a great number 
Acts chapter 6 verse 7. And then we had it went to Judea and Samaria. And they had rest throughout Mark chapter 9, verse 31. And then Acts chapter 17, verse 6. These that have turned the world upside down, growing and growing and growing until it came to us here. And think about our church deeper life. A small number of people that met in flat seven, uh, flat two, flat seven, and then it increased and increased until we're here now, and it's gone beyond Lagos, and it's gone beyond Nigeria. It's, it's, it's the mustard seed that is growing, and it will keep growing. Through you, through me, through us, it will continue to grow in Jesus' name. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is sown, it is, it is uh, the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the, the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And thank God you are part of the number. Growing church, growing kingdom, and I'm part of it, and you are part of it, and nobody will take your part out of it in Jesus' name. Come to Revelation chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number. That's the prophecy of Christ. No man could number of all nations all over the world and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. I am in this number. Are you in the number? I said, are you in the number? Nobody will take your name out of the place. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and upon the and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. You will be there saying amen blessing blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our god forever and ever amen and one of the elders answered saying unto me what are these which are rich in white robes and whence came they and i said unto him sir thou knowest and uh, he said to me these are they which came out of great tribulation out of great trouble out of great trial out of great temptation temptation will not swallow you up trouble will not quench will not put off your light and tribulation will not end your christian confession in jesus name and they have washed their robes, and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, a day before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night, and will serve him day and night in his temple. And he shall, he that seated on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters. Look at this, look at this, look at this. And God shall wipe away and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Will you be there? Sure. Where are you? You'll be there in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I'll be among that number. Those who are saved, I'll be there. 
those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb will be there. Those who are counted worthy to stand in the kingdom of God, I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord.